But free of the tsetse, they were also devoid of its protection. Tranquil now, generations of Shilluk were frequent targets of slavers. Though Arabs were the major buyers, most raids were carried out by other conquered blacks, armed by the slave traders. Destroying an entire village in a sudden sweep, the raiders would leave dead and wounded behind, take their living quarry, chained like animals, for sale at Khartoum, far to the north. As the river itself journeys north, it too enters a landscape vastly changed. Henceforth, it is the single thread of life through a desert in which every blade of green growth will depend on the river. As the ancient Latin saying holds, ot nilis, ot nihil, either the Nile or nothing. At Khartoum, capital of Sudan, the White Nile is joined by its sister tributary, the Blue Nile out of Ethiopia, which will contribute nearly two thirds of the Lower Nile's annual flow. Now a little past midpoint in the Nile's long descent, more than 2,200 miles from its headwaters, Philippe lands the Catalina near the presidential palace, scene of much of the past century's turbulent history. Once a great slave market at which Arabs bought captured blacks from the interior, Khartoum no longer traffics in human life. Today it is a trading center for camels, the cranky beasts which for more than a thousand years have carried goods on the caravan routes radiating westward across the Sahara. Khartoum would play a belated role in the great tide of Muslim and Arab influence, which swept North Africa and for a time reached even into Spain and France. Here, less than a century ago, occurred the climactic struggle between Western and Islamic cultures that would bring black Africa out of its continental isolation forever. Though Western technology often has been the mainspring for new economic growth and development in Sudan, the religious teachings of Islam still hold sway. Here, visitors to the mosque may join the faithful, gathered for prayers five times each day. In the palace, the chanted prayers have an ironic echo. For this, in the 1870s, was the citadel of General Charles George Gordon, adventurer and mystic, once the appointed leader of Christian England's crusade against the Arab slave trade. But to England's moral crusade came a Muslim reply, a jihad or holy war, led by a religious leader known as the Mahdi, or guide. In March of 1884, in the ornate palace, Gordon would find himself a prisoner, Khartoum isolated by the surrounding forces of the Mahdi. Mm. 
For 10 months, defiant but helpless, Gordon could gaze across to the far bank of the Nile, waiting for relief, which never came. At last, in January 1885, the Mahdi's forces swarmed across the river into the starving city and swept up these stairs to find their hated adversary waiting for their spears. In hours, Khartoum was won, Gordon was dead, and the Mahdi reigned in triumph. But the triumph would be brief. In less than a year, the Mahdi was dead. In 1898, less than 15 years after Gordon's defeat and death, the tables again were turned. Here, behind these clay walls at Omdurman, a few miles from Khartoum, the Mahdi's followers themselves would await the onslaught of the British forces under Lord Kitchener. In their decisive defeat, the slave trade in Africa was finally and irretrievably destroyed. But there were other changes, no less profound. Brutally awakened by the canons of foreign powers, much of Africa has passed from isolation to colonialism to self-rule in barely a century. After the explorers and the moral crusaders came the generals and the businessmen and the engineers. The gunboat was followed by the steam shovel and the tractor. Today, the Nile no longer goes its own way. Year by year, like the tiny people of Lilliput trying to chain a Gulliver, well-intentioned men try to bind the giant to their wishes. As we fly northward toward Egypt and the Mediterranean, the Nile still has more than 1,800 miles to travel. The wild freedom of its upland cataracts and rapids, the vestiges of a more primitive continent lie behind it. Henceforth, mile by mile, the river will be progressively tamed, learn to do as it is told. Yet, as we follow the river through the land of the ancient pharaohs, we shall discover that modern man, impatient for quick solutions, cannot always foresee the consequences of the changes he imposes, that the Nile itself, sometimes, is still wiser than he. <laughs> 